So in the previous video, we talked about how AKT can phosphorylate proteins and either activate those proteins or inactivate those proteins, it really depends on the proteins. And those AKT substrates played a role in regulating the cell cycle, regulating apoptosis. Um, so we're going to continue talking about some AKT substrates, some notable, important AKT substrates in this video. So let's get to our first one. So uh, this is uh, an AKT substrate that plays a role in many uh, cellular processes, including the cell cycle, which is important because we're talking about cancer. So the substrate that we're going to talk about, the AKT substrate, is known as GSK3-beta. So GSK3-beta stands for glycogen synthase kinase beta, 3-beta. Um, and that actually plays a very important role in many cellular processes, including glucose metabolism, right? It's got the word glycogen in there. So it must regulate something about glycogen storage. Remember, hopefully you remember glycogen. Glycogen is a polymer of glucose, but we're not going to go down that road here because we're going to focus on GSK3-beta's role in regulating the cell cycle for now. So GSK3-beta, it is a kinase. It is a serine threonine kinase, which means it'll phosphorylate its substrate on serines and threonines. So it looks like here we got a kinase cascade. We got a kinase, AKT. That's our getting ready to kinase called GSK3 beta. Okay. And GSK3 beta, it has its own set of substrates, but we're not going to learn all of its substrates. We're going to learn two substrates of GSK3 beta. Um, and again, I want you to recall that in uh, cells that are in G1, AKT is not phosphorylated and not active. And so GSK3 beta, it is not phosphorylated by AKT. So what do you think the activity of GSK3 beta is? Well, remember, you never know until you're told what phosphorylation does to a protein. So when it's unphosphorylated, when it's phosphorylated, uh, you can't, it's not a one-to-one -one prediction of activity. So you really have to be told, you have to study it, you have to research it, and then you have to be told, and I'll tell you here, that when GSK3 beta is not, does not have a phosphate group on serine 9, it is in its active state, right? So phosphorylating GSK3 beta will see inactivates it. So when it is not phosphorylated, that means it is active. So in cells in the energy 1, GSK3 beta is not phosphorylated on serine 9 by AKT, and this allows a uh, GSK3 beta, the kinase, to be active in its active form. So that means it will phosphorylate its substrates. What are its substrates? Well, I'm going to introduce two substrates to you. I'm going to tell you their names, June, J-U-N, and beta-catenin, sometimes known as beta-catenin. I say beta-catenin. Um, and I'll introduce some of those uh, residues that are phosphorylated by GSK through beta, uh, a threonine at position 239 on June, and serines at position 33, 37, and 41 on beta-catenin. So these two proteins are substrates of GSK3 beta. Not substrates of AKT, they're substrates of GSK3 beta. When GSK3 beta phosphorylates these proteins, what does it do to them? Well, you don't know what these proteins are, but I'm going to tell you what their activity is in a second. And you don't know what phosphorylation does to them, but I'm going to tell you what phosphorylation does, does to these proteins. These proteins are transcription factors. So you know what transcription factors are. They bind promoters and they turn genes on. So when these proteins are phosphorylated at these sites by GSK3 beta, what does that do to their activity? Well, I don't know. I mean, it could make them bind promoters and turn genes on. It can prevent them from binding promoters and then the genes be off. So I'm going to tell you exactly what happens. When they are phosphorylated by GSK3 beta, these proteins, the June and beta catenin, are inactive. Oh, inactive one phosphorylated by G. Wow, so that should not be, uh, I, that's incorrect there. Let me fix that. Inactive one phosphorylated by GSK3 beta. All right, got to fix that. Yeah. They are inactive when they are phosphorylated by GSK3 beta. Okay. Um, so they're not going to be able to bind their promoters and turn their genes on. What genes? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. Because now let's say that cells get a signal to go through the cell cycle. AKT we know is phosphorylated and active. Well, 
now that it's active, what's it going to do to GSK3 beta? What's it going to do to the phosphorylation state? And what is it going to do to the activity of GSK3 beta? So you see, so if you want to pause this video, see if you can predict what's going to happen to GSK3 beta and what's going to happen to June and beta catenin when cells uh, have active AKT. Well, I'll tell you, GSK3 beta will be phosphorylated on serine 9, and that inhibits or inactivates GSK3 beta. Right? So this phosphorylation is an inhibitory phosphorylation. In previous substrates, phosphorylation activated proteins. This phosphorylation inhibits GSK3 beta. When GSK3 beta is phosphorylated by AKT and inhibited, well, then what's going to happen to June and beta catenin on those residues? Will those residues be phosphorylated? They will not. Will the transcription factors be active or inactive? They will be active, right? So when GSK3 beta is not phosphorylating these transcription factors, those transcription factors become active and they will bind promoters. And what I'll tell you is they bind promoters that promote gene, um, to promote the cell cycle progression from G1 phase to S phase. And we're gonna learn in later videos about a very important cell cycle regulator called cyclin D, which is regulated by June and beta catenin transcription factors. So uh, this slide has introduced to you how AKT can regulate GSK3 beta and how GSK3 beta can regulate transcription factors that regulate the cell cycle. Okay. Last, uh, last one. Oh, let me move out of the way here. In, in this slide, we're going to talk about how AKT can regulate protein synthesis in the cell. So you know protein synthesis, and I've uh, got listed two proteins down at the bottom here that play a role in protein synthesis. And we're really talking about translation. So you remember translation from either biochemistry or genetics, learning how mRNA um, can be translated into protein by what? The ribosome, right? So you remember the ribosome, the ribosome is a large structure. It's a very complicated structure. There are many things that regulate the process of translation. You can regulate the ribosome. You can regulate molecules that bind to the mRNA that allow them to bind to the ribosome. So translation is a highly regulated process and cells can um, increase translation or decrease translation. You could have increased protein synthesis or decreased protein synthesis. So when cells are in G1, sure, cells are turning on genes, making mRNA and making proteins, but the protein uh, synthesis level in a cell in G1 is lower than a protein synthesis in cells that are going through the cell cycle. When cells are going through the cell cycle, they need to turn on lots of genes and make lots of proteins to replicate the genome, to divide the organelles, to uh, go undergo mitosis and pull, a cro pull the chromosomes to daughter cells. So the process of the cell cycle going from G1 to S to G2 to M requires a lot of protein. So protein synthesis has to be increased when cells are told to go through the cell cycle. And you will also find these protein, uh, protein uh, translation higher in human cancer cells. AKT regulates protein synthesis. So I'm going to tell you how. It's a little bit complicated. There are a lot of proteins involved here, but that's okay. We can get through it together. So I'm going to introduce this protein called S6, which is a component of the ribosome. So you remember the ribosome, right? It's a very, it's a large multi-subunit complex uh, that accomplishes translation. S6 is a component of the ribosome. Okay. I'm going to introduce one more protein, 4EBP. So I'm just, what I'm going to tell you about this protein, it, in, it inhibits translation. So not completely, not 100%, but when this protein is active, then protein translation will be uh, reduced. Okay. Um, so what controls these proteins? Does AKT control them? Well, indirectly. AKT doesn't work directly on these proteins. AKT works indirectly on these proteins. So how? Well, let's introduce a new protein called P70S6K. So what is P70S6K? Uh, S6 stands for, the ribosome subunit, the K stands for kinase. So P70S6K uh, is, a, is also known as 
S6 kinase. It is a kinase whose function is to phosphorylate the S6 ribosomal subunit. What's that phosphorylation going to do? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. We got to introduce two more proteins that actually regulate those three proteins below. So these two proteins we're going to introduce, one is called mTOR, uh, the mammalian target of rapamycin, um, which is sort of complicated in and of itself. We're not going to go into uh, mTOR. Uh, we could, um, but we're not. So mTOR is a kinase. It's a serine threonine kinase, and it can be present in these large protein complexes. So mTOR is a component of something called mTOR complex one or mTORC one, sometimes referred to. So it's a kinase embedded in this complex. And this complex, which has this kinase in it, called mTOR, uh, is inhibited by a protein called TSC2. So it's a small protein, and TSC2 is an inhibitor of the mTOR complex. I know there's a lot of proteins. Yeah, it is. It is a lot of proteins. But that's okay. We're going to keep track of all these proteins. So all these proteins are going to help regulate protein synthesis. So let's see how. So again, when you're learning about proteins, you've got to learn about are they active or are they inactive, right? In what state are they in? So we're going to talk about these, the state of all of these proteins when cells are in G1, typically, right? So let's go through it. Well, um, since we've got AKT, which is a kinase, and mTOR, which is a kinase, and P6, uh, S6K, which is a kinase, we're going to have phosphorylation. So let's introduce a couple of the phosphorylation sites. So we're going to introduce a serine at position 2,448 on the mTOR protein. We're going to introduce a threonine at position 389 on S6K. Uh, so these are some phosphorylation sites that we'll introduce that we'll talk about in this video. Okay, now let's talk about the activity, the, uh, the, uh, the state of all these proteins. Are they active? Are they inactive? Let's see. Well, we already know that when AKT is, uh, when the cells are in G1, typically AKT is not active. It's a kinase, not active. So uh, I'll tell you what AKT does is it can phosphorylate TSC2 and it can phosphorylate mTOR. But on the, this state, they're not phosphorylated. So in this state, the mTOR complex is not active. So it's a kinase, but it's not active. It's not going to phosphorylate its substrates. Okay. Well, under that condition, the P6, uh, P70S6K, it is also not phosphorylated, and it is also not active. Right? Okay. And that means that those two proteins at the bottom there, uh, the ribosomal component S6, as well as the e 4 ebp they are not phosphorylated. Now, when they are not phosphorylated, what's going to happen? Well, protein synthesis will be low, right? So the ribosome component will be um, part of the ribosome, but not functioning very efficiently. And that inhibitor of translation will be able to inhibit translation. So it can help keep translation low, protein production low. This is going to make hopefully more sense when cells get a signal to grow. You'll see on the next slide. So I'm going to have to move over here shortly. So we know when uh, cells get a signal to grow, exposed to cell uh, the growth factors, for example, that um, AKT is phosphorylated and active. And that's going to affect translation. Let's see how. So first, I will tell you, um, as I did before, that AKT can phosphorylate its substrates are mTOR and TSC2. When it phosphorylates these proteins, what's, what's the result? Well, for TSC2, which was an inhibitor of the mTOR, phosphorylating it separates it from mTOR. So the inhibitor is now inhibited. So the inhibitor is no longer inhibiting. I know that's complicated, but I think you can get that. Now that mTOR is not bound to SS, uh, TSC2, it can get phosphorylated by AKT and that serine. And now this kinase, this mTOR complex one, it is active. So before it was inactive, 
Now it is active. It is a kinase, it is active. It's got a phosphorylated substrate. What the substrates, let's see. One of its substrates is the uh, threonine, at position 389, on uh, P70SXK. This kinase is now active. Now, what did I say this kinase is? It is the S6 kinase. So what's it going to phosphorylate? I think you could figure it out. It phosphorylates S6. When the S6 protein, the ribosomal subunit, is phosphorylated, that's going to make an efficient translation. So translation becomes much more efficient. Protein production synthesis increases. And mTOR will actually also phosphorylate, not just S6K, but it will phosphorylate 4EBP. When mTOR phosphorylates 4EBP, uh, uh, it inhibits 4EBP. So remember, what was 4EBP? It was an inhibitor of translation. So now that it is that is inhibited, it is no longer inhibiting translation. So what's the effect on protein synthesis? Protein synthesis increases. So that's complicated. Absolutely that is complicated. So what is important here is to keep track of all of these proteins in terms of what is their function, what is their normal function, when they are phosphor, when are they active? When are these proteins active? When are they inactive? In G1, what are the, what's their state? In when cells are getting a signal to grow in our cancer cells, what's their state? When um, when they're phosphorylated, what does that do to them? Does phosphorylation activate them? Phosphorylation act inactivate them? So what I recommend sometimes is to make a large table and talk about list the names of these proteins, the activities of pro these proteins, and their phosphorylation states and their activity states. So when they are phosphorylated, so are they active or inactive? When they are not phosphorylated, are they active or inactive? So I know that's a lot of proteins and a lot of phosphorylations, but again, I think hopefully you can appreciate that AKT is a very important regulator of the cell. And now you know some of the substrates that AKT has uh, acts on that regulates um, important processes in the cell.